Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter. Following recent riots, Florida's governor signed a new bill into law on Monday. He calls it the strongest anti-rioting, pro-law enforcement piece of legislation in the country. NTD's Christina Kim reports. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill that will crack down on violent protests and riots in the state. This is a peaceful protest. <laughs> we encourage it. It's the foundation of our country. And we want people to peacefully protest when they feel the need. This is a riot. And this will get you locked up. This comes as the nation faced protests, riots, looting and arson for months following the death of George Floyd. Known as HB1, the law would prevent Florida from defunding the police. It would also hold local governments accountable if they try to interfere with law enforcement during these violent demonstrations. If you tell law enforcement to stand down, then you're responsible for the damage that ensues. And if someone's been harmed or their property has been destroyed, then they can sue you for compensation. The bill also protects monuments from being defaced or torn down. It increases penalties for assault and takes a stand against mob intimidation. If you riot, if you loot, if you harm others, particularly if you harm a law enforcement officer during one of these violent assemblies, you're going to jail. Uh, we're going to hold you accountable uh, and we're not going to end up like Portland where this is just a daily occurrence where these people are doing this. They get arrested, they have their mugshot taken, and then they get put right back on the street to do it again. Governor DeSantis says this shows how seriously Florida takes public safety. The law went into effect immediately starting April 19th. Christina Kim, NTD News. The Chinese Communist Party continues to take internet censorship, surveillance and propaganda to unprecedented levels. That's one of the conclusions from the newest report released by Reporters Without Borders. NTD's David Vives has more. A virus of disinformation is taking over Asia and China's largely to blame. That's according to the Reporters Without Borders annual report released on Tuesday. The NGO says the Chinese Communist Party's state propaganda has scaled up to unprecedented levels following the virus crisis. The whole Asian continent is being contaminated by the virus of uh, media censorship and of media surveillance. This is very, very dangerous. With the exception of Taiwan, Japan, South Korea and Mongolia, RSF says all countries in the Asian region face not only a pressure to change their narratives on the virus, but are being provided help to censor their own journalists. The Chinese regime is providing draft regulations, is providing some uh, surveillance material, is providing some uh, financial assistance uh, for uh, these authoritarian governments to better control the media. Alviani says countries that were engaged with democracies 20 years ago are now forming more partnerships with the CCP. This follows Beijing's investments in Asia. In order to secure these, the CCP creates deeper bounds with neighboring countries. As in Cambodia, where China found 70% of the country's much needed roads and bridges. The NGO director says true democracies should use their momentum to defend against the dictatorship's propaganda and set examples of how to face CCP interference. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. What can Congress do to help Hong Kongers resist Beijing's crackdown? Exiled Hong Kong lawmakers and activists shared their thoughts with U.S. Congress members and the Defense Forum Foundation. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Exiled former Hong Kong lawmaker Ted Hui tells the U.S. Congress sanctions against Beijing and Hong Kong officials are very efficient in helping Hong Kongers resist Beijing's crackdown. First thing that I would say that is to strengthen the sanctions and to widen the sanctions as well. Uh, because the Hong Kong uh, Human Rights and Democracy Act is powerful. 
it is uh, something that's influencing uh, behavior of high officials in, in Hong Kong. But speaking at a Congressional Defense and Foreign Policy Forum Tuesday, Hui also says the number of sanctioned officials is limited. Exiled Hong Kong student democracy activist Joey Siu agrees. She adds, in addition to sanctioning officials, the U.S. should also consider sanctioning entities that have helped the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. Especially financial institutions, which have been involved or have been contributing to the human rights atrocities committed by the Chinese Party. For example, HSBC, which has frozen TED and also the other pro-democracy uh, stakeholders' accounts. Siu points out the CCP has been successful at co-opting the business community in Hong Kong and using red capital and state-owned enterprises to further infiltrate local economies. But she also adds it's not just Chinese and Hong Kong companies that have become subservient to Beijing. We are also seeing our own companies have been kowtowing to Beijing. We have been sacrificing our human rights values uh, in exchange of the very great and also very attractive economic benefits from the Chinese party. So it would also for us to highlight and also to stress on the importance of responsibilities of our own companies. Siu says she believes the U.S. can regulate those corporations and their cooperation with Beijing and Chinese state-owned companies. She says she is pleased about the introduction of the Bipartisan Strategic Competition Act of 2021 earlier this month. Last week, two senators introduced a bipartisan bill aimed at fighting back against Beijing's unfair trade practices. And just Monday, the House overwhelmingly passed a resolution condemning Beijing's suppression of freedoms in Hong Kong. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. James O'Keefe, the founder of undercover journalism nonprofit Project Veritas, has filed a lawsuit against Twitter. This is after the tech giant permanently banned him from the platform. Now, O'Keefe is suing for defamation. O'Keefe announced he would sue Twitter shortly after his permanent ban. On Monday, we are filing a lawsuit. We are going to sue them. He followed through and filed a lawsuit in the Supreme Court of Westchester County, New York, on Monday. His lawsuit claims Twitter knowingly defamed him in their statement explaining his permanent suspension. The suit says the false accusation that O'Keefe operated fake accounts is particularly damaging since he's a journalist, because his profession relies on his reputation for transparency and accurate reporting. Twitter permanently banned O'Keefe, who had over 920,000 followers on the platform on April 15th. The social media giant disseminated a statement to journalists accusing O'Keefe of operating fake Twitter accounts. Despite Twitter's claims, a number of people find the timing of the ban dubious, including O'Keefe. This is not a coincidence. This is sick. In the days leading up to the ban, O'Keefe released a series of undercover videos showing a CNN employee speaking about the network's efforts to remove President Trump from office and intentional fear-mongering for the sake of ratings. COVID, gangbusters with ratings, right? Which is why we constantly have the death toll on the side. We did. We got Trump back. I am 100% going to say it. And I 100% believe it that if it wasn't for CNN, I don't know that Trump would have got voted out. In response to O'Keefe's ban, Donald Trump Jr. wrote on Twitter, in case you haven't figured out how it works by now, CNN spreads propaganda to elect Democrats, and then Twitter runs interference to protect CNN. They're all on the same team. Twitter also suspended two separate Project Veritas accounts in February. O'Keefe says Section 230 has protected Twitter in the past, but he claims the social media giant won't be protected from his defamation lawsuit. A boat that can almost fly is making waves on a lake in the Alps. An all-electric vessel is hoping to define the future of boating. NTD's Arian Pazdar has that story. When the boat's pilot pushes the throttle, his vessel almost takes off like an airplane. So we're using about 25 horsepower now at a speed of 20 knots. And a normal boat will consume about 100 or 120 horsepower at this speed. The Sweden-based company's new Candela 7 electric boat uses hydrofoils. They act like underwater wings, lifting the boat's hull up into the air and reducing water surface friction by about 80%. That makes it possible to cruise long distances on battery power alone. Flying boats have been around for a century um, and uh, and they have been uh, pretty popular but they also had drawbacks because the foils uh, 
uh, protrude quite a bit and they, you can't retract them. But Candela's design solves those problems. With the use of modern technology used in drones and smartphones, Candela 7 can sail on lakes and rough seas. Sensors on the bow of the boat detect waves. If we would have made this boat 25 years ago, it would probably have cost you 15 million uh, euros to, to buy. Now the boat costs about $300,000. The Candela 7 also comes with a smartphone app, so owners can track their journey, the vessel's battery life and control music and lighting. The big difference is that this boat is 95% cheaper to operate, so it's basically free to cruise on electricity. He added that cruising for an entire day costs less than 10 bucks. Malberg has high hopes on his boat design. So we think this is the future of boating. This is how boats will look like in the future. While the Candela 7 is the Swedish startup's first product, the company aims to use its foiling technology on ferries and ships as big as 200 feet long. Candela plans to launch a ferry near Stockholm in 2022 that can carry up to 30 passengers. Arian Pastar, NTD News.